And now talking again about authentic materials, but I'd love to know a little bit more about how you use authentic materials to add cultural lessons for your students into your online content. Oh, if you don't mind, I'd love to start with you on that question since you were oh, talking about just everyday oh, things. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize. Yes, yeah, so uh, I mentioned already the resources, but I can just give you a couple of examples. For example, the excursions, right? I chose my students to work in pairs and they would go to the, I will give them a list of virtual excursions, like a few museums, and I would assign a specific museum to a student. Sometimes I would just ask them, like, choose the museum of their, of your liking, right? And they need to follow this and they will go there, go to this virtual museum and they, uh, I give them a task. It's like a scavenger hunt. And that's what I think that is uh, interesting and helpful for students is like to create some kind of um, uh, a game, right? It's like a scavenger hunt. You need to do this and this. You need to find couple items. For example, you need to find couple items that are from, let's say, the 19th century. You need to find a couple items that were created by female um artist, female, uh, you know, create uh, cultural producers, something like this. You need to find, for example, two items that you like the most and you need to explain. So, and they will go, for example, it's it's a form as a, a, a graphic organizer and they need to walk around, stroll around, uh, check what they, like trying to check the information and then fill out this uh, form. And uh, the final, uh, the final results will be like them sharing their find uh, findings in in the classroom. So and it it was we could do we did this in the past both online. We did this also in person when students could use their iPads and the computers uh, in the classroom, and then they would talk in the classroom, reporting back about the items that they found. Right. So it's definitely this is the cultural. They're learning about the cultural aspects. Also the uh, like museum, uh, not museums, but movie theaters and. Uh, for example, I would tell them, okay, you can go to these websites, but you need to find the information. You need to find one of the uh, films that you're going to watch tonight, right? You're you're in this country, you're in this city, but you need, or from the whole list of the movies they're showing this week, you need to find the ones that are made by uh, either Russian-speaking film directors or like film directors from a former Soviet Union. So you need to find, so they start searching, right? Looking for the films. And some of them, it will be easy because if they have images, they might recognize, oh, this is Hollywood, right? This is Tom Cruise. This is definitely not the film. So these are like, they have visual cues there, but then they will find, and then you can uh, give them some time depending on the level, right? If these are more advanced students, they can do independent research online and say, okay, here's like, find a little bit, go to v Wikipedia, Russian Wikipedia and find uh, a little bit more information about this filmmaker or about this film. And then say, tell uh, tell your students, other students, why we all should go and watch this film tonight, right? So it's like your task uh, is to pursue, persuade them to watch this specific movie and not the movie with Tom Cruise, for example, right? So, and uh, that's just a couple of things. It's just we're recreating semi-authentic experience right all the same thing with the menus and restaurants i would tell them i will give them a few uh, websites to work with but then they need to to have small debates and kind of make all their classmates all their group mates to go to this specific restaurant because this restaurant is the best in terms of pricing in terms of uh, uh, choices in terms of uh, like i don't know if you have allergies and different dietary restrictions again based on students' uh, individual experiences and their backgrounds. For example, I use, okay, do you guys have any allergies? Oh, you are gluten-free, uh, you are glu uh, uh, you're allergic to gluten, you all cannot do this, you're not uh, eating meat, for example, you're vegetarian, and now you choose them. So, and that's what I found really good. And the restaurants which I include, it will be restaurants from Russian uh, speaking countries, but also the ones from like uh, Georgia, um, uh, Uzbekistan and food that we also eat and we appreciate a lot people from the former Soviet Union but somehow very often in our textbooks we we'll only have like borscht and then blini and then pinne <laughs> and then students don't know what is hachipuria is they don't know what is I don't know satsivi is and stuff like this even though like many of us know them of this and this is the cultural aspect that can be introduced 
Yeah, I love all those ideas. And I, many of my students, as well as myself, I'm very food motivated. So anything related to food, we can train them to go and do. Thank you for sharing that with us. Shannon, I'd like to ask you next, please. And again, the question is, how do you use authentic materials to add cultural lessons and components into your online content? Again, I have something very specific to share, and I'm really excited to share it because it's hot off the presses. Um, it, we haven't even announced it yet, but um, my colleague Anna Tumarkin and I have completed uh, an open educational resource. This is a an, an online textbook that um, is free. It, it's interactive, and um, its its title is Diverse Russian, and I think Jim will put the uh, the um the link into the chat but um i want to tell you a little bit about the the book um because it has culture at its at its heart really um as all of us know um the last two years one of the things that we've been um struggling with a little bit is like like what olga just said is that um a lot of our materials that we have focused mostly on russia Whereas because of the war, our students aren't studying in Russia anymore, at least right now, and they are studying in other uh, places where there are Russian speaking communities. And so this open educational resource is meant to introduce them to places where Russian is, where, where there are Russian speaking communities. And it's chock full of, of authentic materials and, and culture, and it introduces uh, each, it has chapters on Ukraine. Kazakhstan, um, non-Russian populations in Russia, the Baltics, Sakartvelo or Georgia, and then the United States as well. And so um, we're hoping that this will be uh, a supplemental text to uh, intermediate, intermediate level textbooks, and we'll hopefully be able to introduce students to culture using the Russian language. And just to add to that, one of, this is one of the ways in which I think online materials and online uh, online learning can shine because uh, one of the things that uh, we tried really hard in the book is to have it be flexible for students of different levels. And since culture, as Evgeny mentioned, he talked about not wanting to simplify texts sometimes and but culture texts that have a lot of cultural content require a lot of support and uh, online tools can allow us to include that support but have it be available only when needed so that students of different levels can access it if they need it but sort of ignore it if they don't need it and so i think that's one way in which online materials can really shine in the introduction or in the um inclusion of culturally rich materials because that support that is often needed can be uh, provided in ways that are maybe less obtrusive or easier to easier to use in some ways. And so I hope everybody will check out our book. We're going to be um, announcing it soon and um, hope it will be useful for people. Much appreciated. Everyone loves a good OER. So thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us, especially we kind of are getting a little bit of an exclusive. So thank you for sharing that with us. And yes, it is nice sometimes in the online environment, it's easier to put that scaffolding in, in some cases and kind of impose it where you can add it. But some populations might not need it. Uh, maybe if we have some heritage learners that are uh, maybe lived most of their life in operating in the target language they might not need that extra scaffolding but somebody coming in uh, truly as a novice low just parroting what we're telling them they might need that scaffolding and it's, it is easy sometimes in that online environment to add it thank you for that um, Evgeny asking you the same question again talking about the culture and, and jumping back into that topic can you tell us more about how you use authentic materials to add that cultural component into your online content um, yeah, I, I mentioned uh, some of this brief, briefly in my previous uh, answer, and I first of all, I want to applaud Shannon for this resource and thank her for this tremendous work uh, she and Anna uh, did. It's, it's very commendable. I like the balanced approach, how you uh, include, you know, uh, uh, both Russia and non-Russia in this resource. And I think this is something we need to be thinking now 
more than we we did in the past what culture we teach what is it we teach what is this uh what is the content uh how is an important question but now selecting of selection of material thinking about uh a, a diverse but balanced perspective that our students uh, deserve to get uh is something that i've been thinking a lot and um uh also thinking about my own expertise and something that i what i know what i what i where places i've traveled what i've seen in first hand what i've been trained in uh, and I, I think that's kind of also goes back into what exactly we teaching, what kind of culture we introduce into our students. Do we have a responsibility to teach our students some canonical texts like Tatiana Smarodinska introduces in her website? You know, they should know, you know, Chanel and Mamou and, you know, Mertwe uh, or we should st steer towards more, you know, contemporary culture. Uh, and um, kind of a, a, maybe not so not so um, important works of art. Richard Robin, who we all we know and uh, uh, admire as a pedagogue, as a textbook writer, used to say, "The worse, the better." Чем хуже, тем лучше. Meaning, speaking about the language of, for example, TV shows and. Uh, uh, soap operas he said well that's if the if they speaking in the cliche language and say oh i love you or something like that you know that's perfect that's gold for language classroom and that's so that's one approach so we pick something that's mass produced and has seen you know, a kind of a uh familiar content repetitive structure uh shablonny music and then our students can gain language um um i i do think we have responsibility to to introduce tarkovsky malevich uh you know something um something that's outside of our students kind of immediate immediate field of view uh, that's how we do it is 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 in, in, in the, the systematic way the systematicity of this is also something I, I I've been thinking a lot so a lot of times we introduce things kind of a um not randomly but without without a system and there's no textbooks or there's no guidelines that say okay you know first introduce Krasna Ploshit, then talk about Tchaikovsky, and then talk about Gagarin, and then talk. There's no hierarchy of kind of a concepts and uh, figures and uh, events and works of uh, literature. Uh, I don't know if we need one. Maybe we should also be guided by our own understanding what uh, what constitutes what what goes into culture. What what's important? What's what's less important? Um, and I also want to emphasize the importance of stories. This is something that we uh, we used a lot as we were writing the second year textbook. Uh, a lot of culture is introduced through personal narratives. Um, and I think especially now when things are so sensitive, so raw, so, so kind of... Um, um, uh, so difficult to to teach sometimes i think by um bringing real voices real people real stories they may be modified they may be slightly adapted uh that's not the point the point is that we introduce real voices from 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 our world to our classroom and have our students learn culture through the lens of the eyes of these people who you know who lived in Russia, who lived in Ukraine, who uh, I don't know um, uh, experienced something fun or tragic or or important, and that 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 helps to create this connection and make this meaningful conversation discussing the lived experience of the person in the story and the lived experience of our learners. Uh, and that's something that can connect heritage speakers and non-heritage speakers and native speakers and, and ourselves, right? I think we 
we often neglect neglect our own kind of a, a um, experience and importance of that experience for for the for the classroom and for our students. Oftentimes, the most interesting stories they hear in the classroom is from us, stories from our childhoods, stories from our youth and our travels. So, um, I would encourage you know for you to think about your own stories and start collecting stories you hear from others or read on uh, online and have uh, the stories uh, kind of in different versions maybe for your novice classroom for your intermediate classroom for your advanced classroom you brought up a really good point about storytelling and how that does build connections even if you think back to some of those beloved stories from childhood the things that just you know really pull you in and and really can essentially keep our learners motivated motivated, keep them wanting to sign up for Russian 2, Russian 3, hopefully Russian 4 and beyond. And yes, making those connections with the students, sharing your own travel stories. For me, that was a big motivator, hearing stories from my language teachers and getting to hear more about their experiences and hopefully getting to experience those things myself someday. That was a huge motivator for me and a great way to keep those students engaged. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And then Larissa, asking you the same question, please. How do you use authentic materials to add cultural lessons and components into your own online content? Oh, yeah, so I um, agree with Olga and Eugenie, Shannon. Um, I would add a little bit uh, that I, I also use the resources that Olga uses for um, for the tours, uh, for the tours. Also, um, Google Maps is a great resource that you can actually um, like go to the Nevsky Prospect and see things around like in the real time. So far, it works. <laughs> Um, and you know, go to the different restaurants. Uh, here's the menu. Uh, or if there is a more advanced uh, language, you can have a complication. So kind of setting up uh, the scenario that they have to uh, act on. Um, for example, you can for the students, you can say you have a limited budget, um, or you live in a particular area. And you have only two hours to where you have to get from point A to point B. And then they have to figure out how to do that um, using the public transportation and, of course, providing all these uh, websites for them to uh, see, right? Not just kind of um, open up the Google and say, okay, you go and find. So uh, have a list of the uh, website that they can use for this uh, research. Um, or you can say, okay, you are um, planning uh, a winter holidays in St. Petersburg and you and your parents are going to St. Petersburg for a visit. You're going to be there for two days and then, um, or two weeks, maybe. Um, you're flying from point A to point B. How, how are you going to get to the, from the airport to, to your hotel? Um, so it's something that uh, really they use the authentic materials. But very often, um, there's a lot of the simple language and a lot of uh, pictures there. Um, another thing that I like to use is um, through the culture that rule also is afisha. So, uh, for example, when uh, we had the spring celebration at Maslinice, uh, we look at the afisha and students in pairs. So there was kind of interpersonal communication while there too. They had to. Uh, look through the different events and choose one that um, they like the best. It'll be for more uh, simple task. And again, with a complication for more advanced learners. Um, it could be a budget or it could be some allergies or it could be something that they cannot stand or, you know, um, they, they are living in point A and they have to be something close to that point. So there are more, com more, more complication for more advanced levels. And also, it's kind of very, very authentic, very fun, a lot of pictures, simple language, um, but they have to really work together to, to get this information. I like to get the uh, afterwards a presentation, so they have to tell the class exactly, like the whole group, uh, where they're going to go and why. Um, maybe even put it in a writing or have like a slide for the, uh, like in Google Slides and show, okay, we're going right here because these events would like to visit there. Um, you can play and say uh, role play to again, uh, change the tenses to like talk about, um, you know, a different person going there, um, maybe a different persona. So there's a lot of things you can do with this 
authentic materials online that can be found. Um, another thing I wanted to say, um, to add to Evgeny's, very important to share stories um, that we possess or you know, our mothers, fathers, grandfathers. And since majority of my students are heritage speakers, they also have stories. Um, and it's it's something you have to create a very safe environment for them to share. Um, but once they feel comfortable, right, it's kind of building this classroom culture too, um, sharing about um, their parents or somebody else. Since not everybody are ready to share, I would always give another choice to maybe find online and read a story or listen to the video or listen to the audio or video. Um, but majority of the students actually, they, you know, interview their parents or grandparents. Um, and like last year, um, we talk about World War II and about the war veterans. I also like to start the lesson with an authentic picture, like the viewing a picture is, is authentic materials. For example, picture uh, taken in a uh, Park Pobeda, veteran in a So like uh, two veterans sitting on the, um, on the bench celebrating the victory day. Very, very authentic picture, like uh, people there. And then we discuss that kind of forming up and uh, students will say, oh, I notice, uh, I wonder, I have a question about it. So having this discussion on a real picture, real people um, from the present time too. Um, and then we slowly like get to the next uh, when they discuss and um, look at this and uh, answer each other's questions. And then after that, I introduced, you know, some topic and uh, uh, things. And um, our was the sharing role modeling, I would say about my grandmother, who, you know, have a whole presentation for grandmother. And then um, they know what to do. And then they uh, interview their grandmothers or somebody from the internet. They can find somebody like, oh, they might say it's not, it's just a person that my parents know. They don't have to, they can be anonymously. Again, it's could be the sensitive uh, topic nowadays too, um, so they have a chance to to stay anonymously to stay anonymously. And then, but presentation that they uh, created about their uh, relatives and grandparents were just so touchy, and then everybody kind of seeing that oh, we all have like a similar background, um, and we connected like in, in history in time. I also like to use songs. Uh, for my own time, I'm a perestroika person who was living in, in Russia at that time. And it's lately actually became very current too. There are some things we discuss. Um, and using the authentic text of the song of a group of kino, um, very simple text, a lot you have to explain if people don't know like when it was written, why it was written and, and, and so on. Um, they might say, well, the music is not actually that, that advanced, right? Or, um, but, you know, the history behind all these words, um, first make them uh, interested in learning more about it. Um, so this is, I think, the higher praise that can be for our lessons is when students uh, beyond the classroom, they go and ask these questions and have some interest in it. Um, which I've seen that, and I'm really happy to to see that um, when they learn one thing and they want to learn more, even you know, not in our classroom control time. Uh, I think this is our the biggest goal that we want them to to be the the learners who are going to continue their study, you know, with us or without us, have some critical thinking uh, going, and authentic materials can actually provide this base of study you know later on when they're you know not even in our classroom i really love that you mentioned songs because i think that's an often very overlooked way to hook students into the culture and, and the music and, and even the language learning learning new vocabulary words that they might not have encountered in our textbooks and i like how you also talked about how we want to encourage them to continue to keep studying. We are all lifelong learners and we will continue to learn and and grow even all of us personally in our lives. So I like the idea of 
bringing in things like music, like songs that people can connect with and they're motivated to keep studying. Thank you for that. Excellent.